What if you could speed up time just like that? What if you could be at different places at the same time? What if your world had no clocks? What if you could simply stop time? What if you could defeat death? What if the world came to an end? In 1909, the Italian futurist F.T. Marinetti wrote Il tempo e lo spazio morironi ieri Time and space died yesterday. A hundred years later this sounds a bit strange, but looking back at what changed in the way people experienced and thought about time, it made a lot of sense and it was very prescient in many ways. For instance, in 1912 there was the introduction of Greenwich Mean Time, which for the first time in human history united the planet through time by dividing it up into time zones. Small things like the introduction of um, the second hand of the clock not moving mechanically, like tick, 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 but with a softly sweeping movement, that too was introduced in the first half of the 20th century. The effect of it was, of course, that people looked at their clocks and thought it came as natural, this mechanical clock time, as natural time itself, as the seasons, the days, the nights, and so on. There was the introduction of radio, which in a very strange way, unheard of before, could address audiences in different places, but at the same time. There was, in factories, for instance, the introduction of Fordism, the idea that labor at the conveyor belt could be maximized to a point of maximum efficiency, and no time would be wasted. Time is money, as the expression goes. There was the introduction of Einstein's theory of relativity in physics, which argued that time was to be seen as some sort of fourth dimension. There was the idea that people have private time as opposed to public time. During the day they were supposed to do all kinds of things together with others in this sort of time grid, and in that private time they could do what they wanted to do. This, of course, gave rise to um, uh, something like the leisure industry and tourism. There were new philosophies of time developed by people like Edmund Husserl, whose archives are here, the University of Leuven, uh, by people like Henri Bergson, uh, Martin Heidegger, and so on. So a lot of things changed during the first half of the 20th century with the way people thought about and experienced time. And of course, unsurprisingly, a lot of writers and artists in the same period also reflected about this or on this in their work. Think, for instance, of Charlie Chaplin's famous movie, Modern Times, which I'm sure you all know. Um, there, for instance, we see a labourer portrayed as being unable to follow this new kind of rigid uh, time machine, if you want. Literally, he gets stuck in the conveyor belt and into the machine. Um, or think, for instance, of Kafka's Die Verwandlung, the metamorphoses, um, in which a character wakes up as a bug. The first thing, of course, the character thinks is, oh my god, I've turned into a bug. But the second thing is a panic, because he's going to miss his train. So time, the pressure of time, the way people experience time, it seems to have been a topic widely addressed throughout various arts. Not always in negative terms. Various artists and writers also sees this new phenomenon, these new ways of experiencing and thinking about time to develop other temporalities, to come up with still different ways we might experience time. At the beginning of Metropolis, Fritz Lang shows us two different clocks, one for the workers with 10 increments and one for the managers with 12 increments which shows in a visual way that they do not share the same temporality. On that image you can see Freder, the savior of the people, trying to stop the clock, to stop the frenzy rhythm of the work, because they can't take it anymore. In the image you can see that his arms are outstretched, as if he were crucified on the altar of mechanized time. His efforts remain vain, of course, and you have this biblical reference uh, later when he says in agony, Father, Father, will ten hours never end? 
echoing Christ, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? However, uh, the end of the film conveys a rather positive message because this character plays a positive role of a mediator and you can have the idea that in the end all social classes will share the same temporality. Showing the passing of time has always been a major issue for painters, but at the beginning of the 20th century it seems to become almost an obsession. You can see it, for instance, in Marcel Duchamp's work Nude Descending Staircase, Nude Descendant l'Escalier, in which he is clearly influenced by chronophotography. Another striking example could be found in a painting by um, futurist Giacomo Balla, Dynamism of a Dog on a Leash, in which you can see a trotting dog with multiple limbs, and the lady who's walking the dog also has multiple feet, some transparent and some solid, in order to give the impression that they are actually walking. The fact of showing multiple limbs has, by the way, become a very common place in comic books nowadays. The first chapter from Virginia Woolf's novel Between the Acts reminds us that books can be like leather-covered, grunting monsters that grab and devour our sense of time passing. In one of the novel's opening passages, Mrs. Swidding reaches for her favorite reading, a volume mysteriously titled An Outline of History. Upon opening the book, she, along with the novel's reader, finds herself surrounded by the history of our entire planet. A few moments of reading in actual time thus open the infinite space of so-called mind time, allowing us to survey a time when the continents were still united and our planet was populated by vast, elephant-bodied, seal-necked monsters like iguanodons and mastodons and mammoths trudging through the vastness of a steaming primeval forest. Virginia Woolf here demonstrates modernism's tendency to stretch and warp time, as is also exemplified, for instance, by the works of Marcel Proust and James Joyce, who all rely heavily on the stream-of-consciousness technique. You all have this kind of frame with photographs of your parents, your brothers and sisters, or your kids. In French, they call this kind of frame a pale male. In the 20s and the 30s, the surrealists loved to play with the idea of the pale male. For them, it was a way to find their own places in time, to choose their own ancestors, and to establish their own literary history. Here, you have an example by Louis Kutner, a Belgian surrealist. You can see Lenin, Hegel, Freud, Alfred Jarry, or Lewis Carroll. In this frame, Skutner is presenting portraits of people he considered to be family. For him, a pen male is a visual form of a genealogy, a genealogy of his own and a genealogy of surrealism. Another example would be the one by André Breton the one he made to illustrate the famous anthology of black humor. You can see Freud again, but also French poets such as Baudelaire, Rimbaud, Apollinaire, or painters such as Goya or Picabia. For them, and now for us, the pale male is a new way to think of art in time and history. The example of the pale male is interesting because it shows how experiments with time in modernism and the avant-garde also leads to different ways of thinking about history. Thinking about time, as we've done so far, is interesting because it shows how we live in time and potentially also could live in time differently together. But it's of specific interest to the MDRM research lab that organized this conference because it also shows us how we might think of art and literary history in still different ways. MDRN is a research lab at the University of Leuven that has about 30 researchers who all study uh, the literatures and arts of uh, the first half of the 20th century. And all in some way they're engaged in finding other different new ways of writing literary and art history. And this is of course why this topic is of interest to us. What we think is our past might also change, therefore, if we come up with other ways of experiencing and thinking about time.